I hereby introduce to you, Mr. Michael Veazey. Back to Amazing FBA. This is a very interesting interview for us. We've got a, an Australian on the line, which is a different kind of voice. Um, one who's seen uh, the perspective from Australia, from the USA. Serial entrepreneur, and his name is Adam Hudson. He's been an entrepreneur for about 20 years, but in the last two or three years, he's focused really exclusively on Amazon. And a uh, fascinating guy. Got an awful lot of different things to get into him with. So uh, let's launch. Adam, welcome to the show. So lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So where, where are you um, coming to us from? Which part of the globe are you uh, coming from today? Right now I'm in Hollywood, California. In fact, right here just behind me is the Hollywood Walk of Fame with the stars and all that stuff. I'm, yeah, just uh, right in the middle of it all in Los Angeles. Wow, a very glamorous location to be coming from. <laughs> and uh, certainly plenty going on around you. Exactly. So um, yeah, and you've got a bit of music going as well, I can hear. So um, tell me about the, uh, your, your background. Obviously, you've got a massive background as an entrepreneur. So um, how did you get started with that? Was it sort of something that's, that's recent? Is it sort of something from many years ago? Yeah, look, I've been an entrepreneur now for um, more than 20 years, which means I've failed at an awful lot of stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I started straight out of high school. I sort of knew that I didn't want to have a job. And um, that when I first heard the word entrepreneur and found out what it meant, I was drawn to that straight away. So, um, yeah, really, um, I've been doing it for 20 years. I've owned all kinds of businesses. And uh, now I focus entirely on the Amazon uh, space. So it's, uh, it's really cool. I I'm, I'm had a very varied background. Fantastic. So um, was that an, an online, offline businesses? Or have you, have you had a lot of business experience only online? or? No, I've had all kinds. I've owned everything from a flight simulator business where I had replica 747 jumbo planes. I had a, 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 a hairdressing salon. I've owned a finance company uh, where we raised, this is a little bit later, I, we were raising equity capital. We were the first crowdfunding platform in the world based out of Australia originally. Um, so I've had a really diverse background. Um, in all kinds of businesses and as I've gotten older I've moved towards online uh, as the world has moved that way and um, now pretty much entirely online. I, I had an animation company which a lot of people know me for which I started in Los Angeles nearly five years ago and I sold that company last year. That was my last traditional business. In fact I started it in the building I'm sitting in right now before we expanded and opened an office on Sunset Boulevard. Um, and yeah that, that was my last sort of traditional service-based business and uh, that it was when I was running my animation company that I started in Amazon part time, knowing that I would sell my animation company and I wanted an income to replace it with. Wow. Okay. So you have a really very diverse background, even for somebody who's coming to Amazon. That's amazing. So, <laughs> so what was it that prompted you to get into Amazon in the first place? Especially if you were doing service type company, uh, was there something about the nature of services versus products that prompted you? What was it that made you shift? That's a great question and the answer is very much so. There was two things that attracted me about products. One was my whole life I'd pretty much um, built services and in the last 10 years of my life mainly digital products so or finance. So finance you don't actually build anything. Um, and so I wanted to do something where I could physically say this is what I do and hold it in my hand. But the big draw of products um, was that it was the ultimate don't sell your time business. Um, because you know, once you've developed the product and you've done all that hard work, um, the products can sell 24-7 all over the world and you get paid over and over. And that was hugely appealing to me. My animation company was great, financially successful and all of that, but I had a lot of people. You know, We had about 50 people all told, voice actors, script writers, animators. So there's a lot of people and moving parts, whereas products, it was just so leveraged. So that was the, the real draw. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, and I can certainly relate to that. I mean, I don't have a, a big business background like you have with uh, bricks and mortar sort of employees, but I have done a lot in the music industry. I've done a lot of conducting, and certainly there you've got a lot of moving parts. You've got, say, 60, 70 performers in an orchestra and possibly like an amateur choir sometimes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that can produce a hell of a lot of headaches, like 50 headaches there, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I yeah. can relate to that. So um, so what, what was it particularly about Amazon then? So I can understand the, the move from services to products because you work one you've got something tangible which I can relate to as well and you've got something where you work hard up front and then it, it keeps selling for you but why Amazon specifically? Well I looked at Amazon I think four years ago now and the first thing that impressed me was just their growth and 
you know, they're a phenomenal company in any context, online, offline, any industry. Those numbers were super impressive to me as a business guy who, who lives and dies by spreadsheets. I'm the type of person who knows exactly what my margin is on anything because over the years I've, I've had to learn the difference between turnover and leftover. Um, and, um, you know, their numbers as a company were impressive. But um, what I really loved was three things. Number one is that you didn't have to build a website, which um, building websites could be challenging for a lot of people. I love the fact that you didn't have to find the customers because they already had them and I love the fact that they handled all the fulfillment and shipping. Um, that, that's a game changer. FBA just changed the rules uh, of, of uh, product distribution. So uh, living in Australia when you have 25 million people down there, which is less than the population of California. So um, it was kind of super appealing to be able to sell into the biggest markets in the world from wherever you are in the world. That dream was extremely attractive to me and, um, and as it turns out, it's become a reality. Fantastic. And so did you start off, were you living, so you, your company was in California that you sold, is that right? The animation one? That's right. And I was living here full time for five years, four, four years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did you start your Amazon business from uh, America as well? Or were you in Australia or? No, I was, I was here. I actually bought a course and then I did nothing for a year. And then a year later, I was still getting emails from the people who sold the course. Only now they were showing me all the people who started when I did. And I wanted to shoot myself because I was like, oh, what have I done? I've missed this opportunity. Like probably everybody who's starting at Amazon now thinks it's too late. I, it was no different to when I started. Everybody thinks they start too late. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how I got started. Okay. I mean, that, that you've touched on a very important point. So you presumably think it isn't too late to start an Amazon even now? Oh, it absolutely isn't. Um, I started uh, at six products at the start of this year, 2016. People were... Some people are like, oh, it's all fine for you, Adam. You started four years ago. So I said, all right, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to start with six products. And uh, I'll start in, I think they kicked off in February or March. And uh, they're up to around a million dollars a year run right now. Um, and that was just starting at the start of this year. So um, it's absolutely not too late. There's so much opportunity out there. And, and you'll see why I see opportunity as we go into this. I know what we're going to be chatting about. So there's always opportunity for people who have proper education and know what they're looking at. Um, most people don't and know what they're looking at in a real granular business sense. When you develop those eyes, it's never too late for people who have the right knowledge. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's get into that then. So um, before we talk about how to find products, it's, it's always the big question, right? What, what products to pick? What are the magic criteria? You know, what's the magic formula? One thing that's going to make everything work, which, of course, is probably doesn't exist. But um, first of all, um, tell me, what your perception is about the different marketplaces. Um, do you think there's still opportunity in .com, the USA, or do you think that opportunity has shifted to other places, or do you think it's in both? Um, well, it's really fascinating. Um, this past year, my European business is almost, it's about 70% now of what I do in the US, which is amazing. Um, and what's even more interesting is that my and we're going to be talking about ACOS and PPC, the cost of getting customers in Europe is a, about a third of what it is in the US for me or a little bit less even. So it's far less contested in Europe. Uh, and the other thing is that in Europe, you guys love to actually talk to us. So I have automated email sequences that go out and I get probably double the amount of email from the Brits than I do from the US because they're so jaded here but I'll have an automated email that says, hey, I'm just checking in. Did you get the package okay? You guys actually write back. <laughs> so it's a much more fertile, polite, um, uh, re responsive audience, um, and they love it when you pay a little bit of attention to them. So I, I'm really excited about Europe and Germany as well. Um, the UK and Germany are both great markets. Spain, France, Italy, not so much for my products, but certainly Germany and the UK, very strong. That's very interesting what you say, and I think this is, um, it's very, very interesting to hear you say that your sales volume, I, I presume you're talking about volume revenue, yeah. is 70% in Europe uh, of the size of the US, so I know that's pretty substantial, but um, that's one of those things that goes around, which I believe to start with, which is that the sales volume is always huge in America compared to the Europe, and actually that's kind of being a bit of a myth, I think, like people overlook Germany, it's actually bigger than the UK, and of course because of the language barrier, if you're lazy, then you can kind of not look over the water from even from London, which is crazy because it's not very far. 
physically but um the other thing is interesting that does mirror my experience and that of my amazon buddies who've been in the game say two or three years is um yeah the advertising cost is way lower and i think way. the people overlook that at their peril really so well let's hold that thought i think that's a really really important point i'm glad you've touched on acos and, and advertising costs um just before we do that let me just talk a little bit about the wider the big picture before we go into the small picture are you in any other markets outside of dot com and and europe or is it just just no i'm just in um dot com and then i'm in spain italy germany france and the uk okay yeah so fine and so that's i mean it's relevant i think that's pretty much all of the audience that we have is, is relevant for them and i know that there's one or two outliers who like trying out dot jp you know in japan and having yeah. great success but that sounds like a hard nut to crack so Great. So let's focus in on Europe and uh, USA. So you've touched. Let's talk about the differences first between those markets, because I think one of the big decisions you're going to make up front is which marketplaces you're going to start selling in. At least, okay, you may expand later. Um, what are the big pros and cons of dot com versus the European marketplaces from your perspective? Well, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I think you know the US is always very appealing because it's so big. Um, but along with being so big, uh, there's also a lot more competition. And this is, America's been home to the Amazon course gurus who've pumped a lot of courses out to people trying to start businesses. And the challenge, of course, which I saw very early, is that when you educate thousands upon thousands of people with the same strategy at the same time, that's just going to lead to problems, right? Um, especially if the strategy is flawed to start with, which I believe most of them are um, in the way that they look at business generally. So um, so the US is an amazing market if you have the right education, and I still think the right education and the right lens would make America still a great place to do business. You can't, you can't really beat the US economy. It's just so big and broad and so on. Uh, that being said, if you live in the UK and you feel more comfortable in the UK, I certainly wouldn't be recommending people not to launch there. It's a fantastic market, much easier to access, much faster to rank, um, and uh, a very appreciative group of consumers. So I, I would probably still launch in the US personally. Um, and for foreigners, if you're gonna, if you don't live in either the US or the UK, I'd start in the US. It's easier to join. Compliance is a little lower in terms of getting your account set up. The European. It's so tough to get your account set up with verification and stuff for foreigners. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, of course, as a UK dweller, I haven't had that experience of, of how tough it is to get set up here. So I mean, I, you know, that's one reason why I run the podcast because, it, as you said, there's a lot of Americans are the gurus, and there's a lot of American podcasts, and they're very much focused on the American experience. So I wanted yeah. to give a, you know, it's 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 not like the fundamentals are different from a business perspective, but there are some significant differences. I mean. If you're VAT registered, because from the beginning, i.e. adding 20% to all your prices versus not being, I mean, that's pretty huge as far as I'm concerned. So, I mean, it's not a, it's not a technical that, distinction, right? No, as that's I'm, an interesting one, actually, that you touch on the VAT, because it's not a level playing field right now. A lot of people are not registered for VAT, and so they're at a significant disadvantage, um, the people who are registered to those who are not, until Amazon makes it that you cannot sell on Amazon in the UK without a VAT number. Now, when that change happens, it's going to be a level playing field. But for right now, there's a lot of people going, well, I'm not going to be the first guy in the space to register for VAT because my prices have to go up 20% above everybody else. So, Yeah, interesting point. And uh, there are quite a lot of UK sellers bitching about that in the moment. But I think, well, it's like everything else in business. Okay, you need to deal with reality as it is rather than how you feel it should be. But to come back to an important point you just touched on, which I... To some extent, agree with, um, but I want to get your take on it. You were saying that the US could be a fantastic place to be, but were could, could still be a fantastic place, which I think is interesting. Um, but the training models that people had back in the day, you know, when they had thousands of people going into it, um, were flawed. So, in what particular way do you think they were flawed, and in what way do you think you need to see things differently in the US well, specifically? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, one of the biggest promoters of courses, and I don't want to name names, but I just want to just say one of the biggest promoters sort of put out programs saying that people sell stuff under forty dollars with high bestseller rank. Um, so go to the BSR and when they first launched their program it was like in the top one hundred of any category. And then as they sold more courses they went, Oh goodness, we need to expand that because now we have, you know, five thousand people looking at the top one hundred of fifteen categories. So the math quickly doesn't work. 
So not only, it's not about whether it's the best seller, you know, because best seller rank doesn't mean anything. All that actually means is that that's the best seller. It just means somebody's selling a lot of them. But in business, it's not about how many of something you sell, it's about how much margin you make, <laughs> right? Which is the difference between turnover and leftover. So I'm in business for leftover, I don't care about my turnover. So what I'm looking for is high margin, um, less contested spaces. And most people that I meet simply don't understand how big Amazon is. It is an enormous marketplace, two million sellers, um, hundreds of millions of products. So there are still large pools of unsophisticated sellers, um, markets that are you know, dominated by big companies where Amazon's just a distribution point. So they have like two photos and 10 reviews and they're on page one for big selling stuff. Um, but most of the mums and dads that raced in were sort of looking for the cheapest possible products that were you know, high, high turnover. But the problem with that is anybody can get into those businesses. So what I look for is a moat around your business, some, you know, some, something that makes it difficult for people to compete that's not as obvious. Um, uh, you know, that, I mean, that sounds pretty straight simple, but um, a lot of people just took the same advice and they were selling silicon baking mats and just these really simplistic, easy things to get and source and copy. And then it just became a race to the bottom. Yep, I would agree with that. And uh, having been part of that sort of thing, I mean, I was sort of pitched into one of these courses about two, uh, whatever, two years and five months, something like that. I don't know what, exactly what it was. And uh, gradually came to realize, you know, that that all was not well with that business model. And apart from anything else, they didn't really explain about sourcing from China. I think at that point, they were just purely obsessed with themselves um, selling supplements in the US. And anyway, so yeah, it was a pretty flawed training from that point of view. But so what are the ways that you personally would suggest putting a moat around things now let's let's try and add a caveat to that let's say if you have five thousand dollars to spend or less if you have say ten thousand if you have twenty thousand because presumably it would be a little bit different with different capital yes yeah, so my first product um was 160 dollars retail so it was not as like most amazon sellers that have come in through a course they're like whoa <laughs> like uh, they were costing me $40 a unit and I was selling them for 160 But the beautiful thing about that first product is that I had like, you know, um, $80 margin in it, which gives you all kinds of options that people who are selling a $12 item don't have, right? So I can go out and spend money on advertising and spend 20 bucks a sale and still be making 60 bucks profit a unit. And um, so that's where I started. I started completely outside of the top selling um, product in my category was like, and the subcategory was like 45,000 in home and kitchen. It was nowhere near the top 1,000. And I came in and started making 15,000 a month sales and about 8,000 a month profit on that very first product um, back way back when. And I don't sell that, that product anymore. Not because it got too crowded or anything, it's because my volume grew so much that I, it was a handmade product and my supplier would take them four months to make the thing, which was dead money for too long. Um, so I've, I've now gone into other products, but um, so that to, 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 to answer your question at five, ten, and twenty thousand, I think the first thing that people need to think about is um, whenever they're looking at a market for anything, you need to think about it from the consumer's point of view. Why will a consumer first of all notice you, and why will a consumer buy from you and not somebody else? And it can't be anything that they need to read about. So if you're allowing them to read the copy and find some feature then good luck with that. Amazon's like Tinder, right? So people sort Tinder out, they go, I'm looking for a guy or a girl between this and that age. And then they just look at the photo and they dismiss or not. <laughs> so yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And Amazon's not different. Like when we go to look for something, the first thing we look at is the photograph. So people miss the very important step that I believe most people miss is, oh, so I need good photographs. Yes, you need good photographs, but you also need something good in the photograph. <laughs> so. If possible, you know, if you can get something that's visually differentiated, something that looks different to start with, that's better designed or has some key feature to it visually, then that's the first battle that you need to win is attention. You need them to notice you. And good examples of that is if you go to Amazon and you look up desktop calculator, you know, on page one, they're all black and then there's one that's green. Um, 
by a company I've never heard of, but all the other ones are by Casio or Texas Instruments, except this one green calculator. If you look up car covers, they're all black or gray or blue, just plain, nothing on them. Whereas if somebody had a car cover that said The Beast or Dad's Machine or a bright pink one that said My Princess's Car or something, it's going to stand out, you know. So the first thing is to think, how can you innovate visually at the core design level? And if you can do that, then you're not throwing in an e-book or having a, an optimized headline. Any idiot can do that who buys a $30 course on Udemy. How do you think like a customer? And so just follow Jeff Bezos's tips. Be in business for the customer. Um, and that's the big, big starting point. And, and with all this kerfuffle with reviews and everything in the last week, at the end of the day, the people who have the best products are still going to win in the long term. When all the hacks and black headings gone away, best products are going to win.